Uh, 2 Samuel 21, I want to read one verse this morning. In verse number 15, the Bible says, Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. Notice these next few words right here. And David waxed faint. We all know the life of David in here. And David, man, he always had a bout with the Philistines. One of the first times you ever see David mentioned in the Word of God, he is face to face with Goliath. As Brother Daniel said, it was a battle between God and the devil. But all through David's kingship, all through David's life, you find that he's always battling these Philistines. He's always dealing with war in these Philistines. And where we're at in Scripture is no different. But I found it really real, uh, real interest in well, what the Bible says. The Bible says he went down and he went to battle one more time, but the Bible says David waxed faint. I want to I want to remind you of something this morning when God saved you, when God saved me, we entered into a war with the devil. I don't know about you, but there are many days that I wake up and I feel like I'm battling the devil once again. I'm dealing with this or I'm dealing with that. Let me just remind you, he hates you this morning. He hates what you're war for. He hates what's going on here. He'll do anything he can to discourage you. He'll do anything he can to to distract you and to get you down and to you to quit serving Jesus. It always seems like we're in a battle with the devil. And I'll be honest, I don't know about you this morning, but sometimes when I battle the devil and I battle Satan, sometimes my spirit gets tired. Sometimes I get weak. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I say, God, I don't know how much more I can take. I don't know how much more of the attacks I can take. And in my spirit, I get just like David. I get tired and I wax faint. If we had to be real honest, sometimes we get burnt out being in the battle. Sometimes life's more than what we can take. Sometimes being in the ministry is more than what we can take. You might be here this morning, and man, I don't know about you, but I've got some help the last couple of days. My spirit's got some help. I feel refreshed. I feel ready to go on. But there might come a time after this is all done when camp meeting isn't going on no more, and the church doors aren't open. You get to the place where you're spiritually just burnt out. You say, preacher, if I'm like that, what do I do? What do I do to get past this burnout? I want to give you three quick things and I'll be out of the way. Number one, the first thing we must do is we have got to refocus our sight. Here's what I do a lot of times when I'm in the battle, when I'm dealing with the devil. Man, I get my eyes so focused on what's going on. I get my eyes locked in and what I'm facing. And see what the devil likes to do. He likes to keep your mind busy. He likes you to keep thinking about that thing and keep thinking about that thing. Man, with the whole country situation like it was last year, all I thought about was COVID. All I thought about was the election. And God got real with me and he said, don't you know I'm still on the throne? Don't you know I can still handle it, but I got so focused on everything that was going on, I got my eyes off the most important thing, and that was Christ. And I'll say sometimes the ministry's the exact same way. I've gone through a little spell in my life lately. Me and Lindsay travel full time. Y'all know that. Going to different places week after week. It's so easy to get up and just preach something you preached before. Have no tears. Have no burdens. Me and Lindsay went to somewhere like that a while back. I got up and I preached. And I'll be honest. Have you ever felt like you just flopped? I mean... I, I got in the car and I said, God, did you really even call me to preach? God, did you really even put me in? God, what did you do by fooling around with me? I looked at Lindsay. I said, baby, what, what was wrong? What did I do? What happened? She said, I don't know. I've heard you preach that before. I've, I've heard it and God, uh, people's got help. And I, I mean, the Lord's moved. And I said, God, what happened? And this is what the Lord told me. He said, son, it's one thing to preach, but it's another thing to preach without me. He said, when's the last time 
you really got before me and you really got a burden and you really went in trying to help somebody and it wasn't just running through the routine. It wasn't just going through the daily motions of the... I'm telling you, if we're not careful, we can get so focused. We can get out of tune with God. We can, we can get so in a routine of just doing this. We get to the place where we are burnt out. We get to the place where we are battling and we get to the place we get our eyes off of Christ and get it on everything else. That's why I appreciate meetings like this because you can come in and you can take a little bit of time. You can sit down and you can remember it really is all about the blood. It really is about what Jesus did for us. It really is about a God that can do exceedingly abundantly above. And if we could just take the time to get refocused and stay focused on the cross, we can get past a lot of the battles we're fighting. I'll be honest, my battles look real small when I'm looking at a God that big. Secondly, with me, number one, we must refocus our sight. Number two, we must learn to rest our spirit. Me and Lindsay went to the doctor the other day. We went for one of those uh, yearly routine checkups. And man, I, I was sitting there on that table. And you know, they take that thing, they run it deep down in your ear. I think they're looking at my brain. Man, they take that flashlight, shine it in your eyes, and take that stethoscope thing, and man, they make you breathe about 400 million times, and I'm sitting there, I can't see nothing, I can't hear nothing, I'm lightheaded, getting ready to pass out, and the doctor looks at me and said, Son, how do you feel? I said, Doc, I feel like I'm about to die after all the torture you just put me through. But he said, Mr. Burt, I've looked at your chart, we drew your blood, I've, I've done all these tests, your checkup looks good, you got a clean bill of health. He said, is there anything that's bothering you? I said, well, doctor, as a matter of fact, I'll be honest with you, I feel like sometimes I'm just dead dog tired. I feel like I wake up in the morning and I didn't get enough sleep. You know what I do for a living. You know we run all over creation. And when I'm home, I'm trying to get this done. I'm trying to get that done. I'm trying to get everything situated. But I said, I feel like I can't never get enough rest. He said, well, here's what you need to do. I asked him, I said, are you sure everything is okay? He said, well, I've looked at everything and it looks fine. I said, well, what, what, what can I do? He said, well, this is what I'd advise you. When you feel like that, why don't you go home and take a 30-minute nap? I said, Doc, that ain't going to work. I said, you don't know what i got to do when I'm home. You don't know what it's like to travel. You don't know what it's like to go through all the pressure and you're trying to make this one happy and you're trying to go here and you're trying to go there and we're home trying to get this done, that done. I said, Doc, I need more hours in the day. I don't need to take a nap. That doctor looked at me. He sat on his little stool with his white coat. He said, I want to ask you a couple questions. I said, okay. He said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, yes, sir, I am. Man, my chest started kind of to bow up a little bit. He said, you're a Christian, ain't you? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, you trust in God? And I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, don't you think if you can do all that and you are all that, you can sit down, you can shut your eyes for a little while, and you can depend on the Lord to take care of all your problems. I ain't never been rebuked by a doctor, but buddy, I was that with that day. Man, me and Lindsay got to going down the road, and I began to think about all that. And the Lord said, Son, don't you know I can take care of you? You really can rest in me. And I think what of our problem is a lot of times, the reason why we may feel burnt out, the reason why we may feel downtrodden is because we hadn't take, taken the time. Your way may not be taking a nap. That's what the doctor told me to do. But man, when's the last time we just took 30 minutes? We sat down with our Bible and we opened it and said, Lord, I'm going to block everything out. I'm going to cut that blessed telephone off. I'm going to shut the TV off. I'm going to lock the kids in the bedroom and I'm going to sit with you for a little while. When's the last time you just sat back? You took some time to really pray, to really get a hold on God, to really tell Him what's on your heart. But see, we got a problem a lot of times of running here, running there. Man, I got to get this done. I got to get that done. I got to please that one. And we ultimately end up grieving the Lord because we don't find time to rest in Him. Why is it you look around and everybody looks tired? Why is it, man, my generation seems like they're getting everything worldly done? But we've left that spiritual. 
Sometimes I sit down and I get that anxiety when I, when I read my Bible because I said, Lord, you know everything I got to get done before we leave out. God, you know I got to do this today and I got to do that today. But he said, how precious am I to you? How much do I really mean to you? Does your, I ain't saying neglecting your priorities this morning, but what I am saying is there's got to be some time where we find some rest with the Lord and rest our spirit. Because if we ain't rested, we ain't doing Jesus a bit of good. He wants our whole heart, not our half heart. Number one, we've got to refocus our sight. Number two, we've got to rest our spirit. Number three, last, we have got to rely on His strength. I tell you this, and I get out of the way. The last year, like I said, we, we went, I stepped out in evangelism in February. Everything fell apart in March, and God supernaturally took care of us month by month, week by week. I mean, things I can't explain how they happened. Doors started open, people started sending stuff, and I said, Praise God, we're going to be okay. But sometimes God will take you through that next test. This year, uh, I, I don't even think I've shared this really with anybody. But this year, uh, y'all know Lindsay, she traveled with me a lot last year. Being a teacher, she was able to go as long as she had wireless internet. She could work from the hotel or work wherever we were at, and it was a blessing. Because I'll be honest, the only thing I really got to do is show up and preach and pray. She does everything else. She packs the clothes. She makes sure I'm sane. Sometimes she even drives. Y'all pray for me on that one this morning. But I can't do what I do without her. She prays for you. She loves you. And man, a lot of times when I'm discouraged, that's my encouragement. A lot of times, like Brother Daniel was saying, when I do feel like a failure, she knows the right thing to say to help me along the way. And to make a long story short, the school told her, they said, you can either come back this, uh, you're going to have to come back this year, you can't travel anymore, and me and Lindsay began to seek God. We got in the middle of that battle. We got in the middle of that heat. My spirit was, was weak, because I didn't know what to do. I said, God, just let another job open up for her. God, let this happen, let this happen. And here's what the Holy Ghost said. He said, here's what's going to happen. She's going to quit her job. I said, God, it can't work that way. Because I don't know about you, but I got a house payment, a car payment, insurance, and I sure like to eat. Somebody say amen. But the Lord said she's going to quit. And I'll be honest, I ain't got time to go into how the Lord showed us and worked everything out, but God, God got us to the place. Lindsay called her school on a Friday and said, I, I'm not coming back next year. I'll work the, the rest of this year out, but I'm done. But here's what the kicker is to that whole story. You know to go to school, you got a mortgage about half of your life away to get there. She had an outstanding loan of $17,500. With everything else we had going on, we knew we had to pay that debt off. Wasn't nobody else going to pay, pay it for us. It was just me and Lindsay. And we began to seek God about that thing. I'll be honest, I wanted to be real spiritual and say, I know God's going to take care of it. I know God's going to do it. But on the inside, I could identify like David. The enemy was beating my mind out saying, y'all ain't never going to make it. You ain't never going to be anything. You're going to starve to death. They coming to get your car. They going to throw you out of your house. How are you even going to make it? Well, I was riding, driving up to a church up in Newland, North Carolina to preach that Sunday. Man, we got in there, the Holy Ghost moved in, God began to help us, God began to help me. And I, the, uh, I didn't even really get to preach. And the preacher said, Brother John, do you got anything on your heart? And I could feel like there was still some people holding back. I preached a little message about giving God your basket. And I got up and I said, Church, I'll be honest, me and Lindsay had to give something out of our basket this week. We had to give something to God that, that was going to cost us a whole lot. I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't know how to do it. And I began to say, uh, we're close with them. I said, Lindsay, quit her job Friday. Y'all pray for us. We got this debt. I said, we're just giving God our basket and trusting Him with it. Well, me and Lindsay left church that day and we were headed to lunch. And she said, John, I got something on my heart. And I said, what is it? She said, I believe God can pay that debt off. And I'll be honest, I was thinking it, but I didn't want to say it because I didn't want it not see to come to pass and her faith be hurt. I'll be honest, sometimes she's a whole, whole lot more spiritual than what I am. I said, well, why don't we just pray and ask the Lord to take care of it? 
And man, we got to going down the road and the Holy Ghost got in our SUV. Me and her was having church after church on the way to the Japanese restaurant to get something to eat. And you know when you get that peace in your heart, like the Lord really is going to do it and God really is going to take care of it. We got back to church that night. God blew in again. Church was over and the pastor was walking around on the pulpit wringing his hands. He said, we got to have a business meeting right now. And I'll be honest, growing up in church, when I heard those two words, I was hunting the back door. And on that day, I was doing the exact same thing. I've seen them things go good, and I've seen them things go bad. We got out in the parking lot. Me and Lindsay were just standing out there talking with some friends that came to be with us in service that night. A man said, y'all can come back in. The meeting's over. Me and Lindsay walked back in, and everybody was looking at us. I said, Lord, they're about to beat us. They're about to stone us. They're about to cut our tires on our car. I didn't know what was going on. We got back in there, and the pastor was standing up there. He said, well, we voted on this, and we need to let Brother John and Miss Lindsay know. He said, we know she's quit her job. God's put this on her heart. Now, keep in mind, I didn't tell them how much that loan was. But he said, as the church, we want to do something for you all. He said, we're going to write y'all a check for $20,000. We don't know how much the loan is, but we hope that's going to take care of it. And I'll be honest, I knew in my heart. I said, Lord, there wasn't no way anybody else but you could have done that. I couldn't have orchestrated. And let me just say this, I ain't one of these guys that goes around and drops a little hint because I got a burden here, I got a burden there. I just try to be as transparent as what I can be. But I'm telling you, that day the Lord taught me. He said, son, no matter what you're going through, no matter how real the battle is, you can rely on my strength. Son, I really do have a plan, man. I was sitting there last night listening to Miss Michaela sing. He's always been faithful and the Lord came back one more time he said tell me a time I've never been faithful tell me a time I have dropped the ball tell me a time there you couldn't rely on me I don't know what you're dealing with I don't know the demon you might be facing the battle you might be going through but you can absolutely rely on his strength there was a many a time in David's life where he couldn't go here he couldn't go there but he'd get in that secret place he'd tell God exactly what was on his heart exactly what was going on and the Lord would supernaturally come by he would take care of this or he would take care of that you can rely on his strength today and let me just say this sometimes the devil will come by and he'll try to put all that junk in your mind again I'm glad I can take him back to the place to say this is where God gave me a promise. This is where God met with me when I didn't know what I was going to do and I didn't know how it was all going to work out. I relied on him here. I can rely on him there. There will be other things in the future i got to rely on him. But I'm got, glad i got a God this morning that's big enough to handle it. He can, help, he can help you just like he helped me. I don't know what battle you're fighting this morning. I don't know how you feel. But I just came to encourage you. There's a God that loves you and he does care this morning what battle are you burnt out from what's the thing you're dealing with this morning why don't you rely on his strength father I love you Lord I thank you God for this time thank you Lord for this church the burden they have my God I ask you Lord help the one that's fighting the battle this morning my God may they refocus their sight God let them find some rest for their spirit Lord most importantly God, help them rely on your strength. God, you can when we can't. So, Lord, I ask you to help them this morning. In Jesus' name. Turn with us. We're in the uh, going to be in the book of, of uh, Luke, chapter number 10. Luke 10. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Verse number 25. If you'd stand with us while we read the scripture, we sure would appreciate that. Like what one old preacher said, we, we do this to honor the one that wrote the book. He said, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he said unto him, or he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. 
This do and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself. I, I want to read that again. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. You ever feel half dead? He said, And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan was, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And, when, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an end, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again... I'll read that again too. When I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he being the lawyer or the scribe, he that showed mercy on him. He couldn't even say Samaritan. Said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Our Father, thank you for this portion of Scripture. You did to edify the hearer encourage our hearts. Thank you for what we've already uh, felt this morning, how you've spoken to our hearts. Remind us, Lord, as you're in charge of all things, money, you're in charge of all things of, um, that we have going on in our hearts and lives. We trust you, Lord. We do trust you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You be seated. I, I want to use a thought this morning. What about eternal life? Now, some say this is about who is your neighbor. And it, it, may, and it is. Certainly it is. But, but it's deeper than that. Listen, this is, this is a parable. And, and we begin first by seeing that there's a certain lawyer. This is a scribe. And he stood up and he tempted him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He tempted him. Well, I'm going to stop and say this to you. God knows all about your heart. He knows all about your life. He knows what you're thinking. He knows where you've been. He knows where you're going. And he knows. Hey, listen. He knows if you're saved or if you're not saved. Now, you can fool a lot of people. I wrote this down. You can fool some of the people all the time, and all the people some of the time, but you'll never fool God. And I don't want to say this to you. Preachers are pretty easy to fool. I, I, I do. I take, I, I take the good side of this thing. I, I say, yeah, you need help, all right. And so we help them. And, uh, and so uh, uh, God, but God knows. Listen, God knows you're sitting here this morning. If you're saved, if you're not saved, God knows all about you. I, I stop right there and say, well, glory, I'm glad he does know about me. I'm glad he knows what I need. He knows where I'm at. Sometimes that's good, but in some cases that's not so good. Now you're saying, hey, listen, one day we're going to get out of this place. The preacher said this morning, baby, be sooner than you think, and you're going to stand before an almighty God and give an account. I, and listen, some people are not ready. They say they are. They act like they are, but they're not ready. And so uh, we, we find that to be so. Now, now he said, uh, what, what does the law say? That's a good thing to ask the scribe. Now, there's three, certainly three classes of people that were against Jesus, and that's the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. They sought, they sought to kill Jesus, to uh, dis discount him uh, and denounce Christ. That's what they went after. That's what their hopes were. That's what their plans were. Let me say this to you. You'll never discredit Christ. You can do whatever you want to do. But Jesus is still God. Yeah. Hey, listen, and so, uh, so, so here we find some things that, that God is. I, I got to looking at this. You know, there are over seven and a half billion people in this world, and God knows the hairs. He's got the hairs numbered on the heads of every one of them. Those that love him and those that don't. Hey, that's a big God. And sometimes we think God can't do this for me. God can do it for you. The question is, do you need that? Is he willing to give what you exactly need? He is. But sometimes we think we need something we don't really need. I, I felt that way. Hey, I bought some things I didn't need. I know one preacher, he bought one of them minivans when it first came out. He said it rode like a pogo stick. And he said, I said, God, I need some help getting rid of this thing. And he said, you didn't ask me about getting it. 
He's a good old preacher too. And I'll tell you what, sometimes we forget to ask God. And, and so uh, there's, there was a plan here to discredit and to denounce Christ. And he tempted the Lord, and the Lord knew it. Hey, listen, God knows when we're tempting him, and the Bible tells us, tempt not the Lord thy God. Uh, but sometimes we do it anyway. Hey, listen, and, and uh, some other things we find, not only is there a plan to discredit Christ, uh, but we see Christ the person. He asked this question. He says, what does it say, lawyer? What does it say, scribe? And the scribe says, um, answering, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. I was looking at this, and this is in Deuteronomy and in Le and Leviticus, uh, where these, this, he's quoting this from. And so we, we know that this is so. We know that it's true. We know the reality of this. And Jesus said, you well said. Now there's some things Jesus said about that. Listen to what he said. He said, thou hast answered right. This do and thou shalt live. You say, wait, you've got to be washed in the blood. Jesus said this in, uh, in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 15. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so what he's saying to this man is love me. Listen, if you love Jesus, you won't have to... He already loves you. All you got to do is love him. And he, hey, listen, he'll give you everything. I, I, I'm glad that if we'll give him what we got, he'll give us what he's got. And I'll assure you what he's got is a lot better than what you got. And I don't know what you got. He's a good God. I'll stop right here and say he's a good God. And so we see this person. He said... He said, but he's willing to justify himself. Listen, he wasn't pleased. This lawyer, this scribe wasn't pleased with just uh, trying to uh, trip Jesus. By the way, you'll never trip up or trick Christ. He knows everything. And so uh, he's trying to trip him, and he asked him his question. He said, uh, uh, willing to justify himself, who's my neighbor? Now Jesus goes into it. So we see the plan, we see a person, but now he goes into this parable. Now, now a parable is a... It is a, a earthly story that has a spiritual meaning to it. And, and I believe what the parables, and by the way, this book of Luke is the book that has the most parables of all the New Testament in it. Some say there's over 100 parables, maybe as much as 250 parables in all the Bible, Old and New Testament. We, we know that they use parables to teach in that day. And so Luke is a book of parables. And, and there's some things that he wants us to know about parables. You know what a parable does? Even though it is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, what it's trying to do is take us out of this world and move us into a spiritual world. Hey, listen, the spiritual world's big, but you can't touch it with your hands. You can't handle it. Hey, hey, you can't handle it with your hands. And so you have to move into it by faith. And listen, if there's anything that's ever pleased God, it's been faith. If there was anything that ever displeased God, it was no faith. And so faith moved God one way or the other, either for or against. He, he recognized faith. I, let me say this. He recognized faith in you. And he said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, I don't know how much that is, but you say it's a very little, but, but in faith terms, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's moving from this physical world into a spiritual world trying to understand who God is and what God's doing. Uh, listen, it's not easy to understand God. But you, you know, if I, if I can understand God, I wouldn't be me. But I believe this, when we get to heaven, I don't believe we'll understand God then. God's big. It, 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 listen, here's somebody can listen to the prayers of everybody in this room at one time. It don't strain him to answer. It doesn't strain him to talk to you. Hey, listen, that's who God is, and that's how God works, and that's why God operates in such a way. And so this parable deals with... Uh, it deals with things such as how we walk, how we talk, how we dress, where we go, who we go there with. It deals with what we read, what we hear, and what we see. That's all in the spiritual realm. And, and it's not, listen, it's not easy to get spiritual. Paul said this. He said he hadn't arrived. Did he not? And I'm going to say this. If Paul has not arrived, do you think you have? It's time to work. It's time to labor. It's time to trust. David said, and the Lord put I my trust. David trusted God. Do you? Do you? L 
listen, there, there's some things here that this is a story of ruin. Here's a man, and by the way, I believe this in a parable. You'll find yourself in a parable. Doesn't matter which parable it is, you'll find yourself in it. Somewhere, some way, somehow. You'll find Jesus in it. That's what he's doing. He's saying this, Lord, he says a Samaritan. He's a good Samaritan. Who's he talking about? <laughs> he's talking about himself. He's not talking about you. And by the way, uh, there's some things in this. Uh, of re it's a story not only of ruin, but it's a story of rejection. He, those that should have loved Jesus or loved this Samaritan, they, they should have took care of him. The, the priest, he, he went by. He didn't, even, he didn't even look. He just said, oh, no, sir. He's going to die anyway. Probably what he said. You're going to die anyway. It's appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment. And then it tells us there was a Levite and, and he came by and he looked on him. That's all I did though. He looked. He said, no help. I'll tell you this. There were some people that, that went by you and looked on you and said you're worthless. You're, you're, of, you're of no value. God can't change you anyway. I'll tell you this. God can take whoever God chooses. He's God. We discount his ability. We discount his power. God's mighty. He's able. And so we find that uh, this is a story of rejection. It deals with the rights of religion. It deals with the rules of religion. Uh, but, but also, listen, it's not only a story of ruin. It's a story of redemption. I'm glad to report to you he's concerned about you. Somebody, I, I, I felt this this week. Somebody here needs Jesus. I, and, and listen, Jesus is the only one that can do it for you. And you're the only one that can do it for him. I, I can't save you. Brother Foster can't save you. Hey, listen, nobody in this room can save you but Jesus. <laughs> and by the way, he is in the house. <laughs> you might have to break the roof open to find him, but he's in the house. Hey, listen, he, he's a, this is a story of redemption. Listen to what he says. He says, uh, but a certain Samaritan. And by the way, this scribe couldn't even say Samaritan. They had a, such a hatred for them, uh, a disdain. I, I'm saying this is bad. I, and uh, and I, I don't know how it is for you, but sometimes we have, we have hatred for people. It's, hey, listen, it's easy to hate this world. It's easy to hate those that hate you. But Jesus said, love those that hate you. He said, give to those who take from you. Listen, friend, that is not easy. That's, that goes against human nature. So what do we have to do? We have to move into the spiritual world. That's what a parable is doing. It's trying to get us into the spiritual. Hey, I, I'm glad uh, you say, well, it, well, you've seen Jesus. No, I hadn't. Not with these physical eyes. But I've seen him, haven't you? And so he's in this room and he's revealed himself. I'm glad one day when I was lost, had no hope, 25 years old, headed the wrong way, God revealed himself to me. I saw him. I saw him. I saw him. He'd already seen me. And he knew what my needs were. And he met my needs according to his great riches in glory. And so uh, here is a, a, a certain Samaritan. And as he journeyed, he came where he was. And when he saw him, he did what? He had compassion on him. When's the last time you had compassion on somebody? I mean, it's easy to look good in a church house. It's difficult on the outside. And by the way, we're on the outside a lot more than we're on the inside. So how we respond and how we live in accordance to the Spirit is very important. This is a story of redemption. He said, and he went, out, he went to him, and he bound up his wounds. Aren't you glad one day somebody came to you and bound up your wounds and poured in oil? That's the Holy Ghost, by the way. And he poured in wine. He, you say, that's for cleansing. Yeah, that's for joy. Hey, listen, whenever the wine we sit in the uh, King James Bible, it talks about joy. I'm glad I have joy unspeakable and full of glory. By the way, I'll say that as I said glory. Uh, you can't take glory from God. 
But what God does is he reveals his glory to us that we might worship him in his glory. That's why we act like we do sometimes because the glory of God fills the room. Listen, I've worshipped God sometimes, hadn't said a word. One, we were in a service, been a few years ago, but we, we crawled in the altar, and I just was weeping, preacher. I mean, weeping. And, and what I found out was that God was there. Nobody was saying anything. It was a hush on that place. That's because the Spirit of God was there. I've also been in meetings where the Spirit of God revealed Himself in mighty and powerful ways. We were in a meeting, and a preacher preached, and uh, nothing happened. Uh, but all of a sudden he came down he had a bottle of water it was hot that day and we were outside and he started slinging that water around all of a sudden the spirit of the Lord came from behind me I was sitting near the back and it hit me in the back of the head and I saw it it looked like a wave going down across that congregation and we, we worshipped the Lord for I don't know how long I don't even know how long we worshipped God some people came to me and said wow you did this and you did that I said well, I don't remember none of that Hey, it's pretty good when you don't remember, isn't it? I like that. Hey, glory, it's a story of redemption. He said on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and he gave them to the host and he said to him, take care of him. Thank God there's one that cares about us. He'll take care of you. I want to report he's taking good care of me and he'll take good care of you. He's a great God. He's a mighty God. Oh, yeah, this is a story about redemption. He said, uh, and he gave it to the host. He said to him, take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, hey, money is no object to God. He can give $20,000, and it don't mean a thing to him. I'll tell you, it'll mean something to you. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And he said, when I come again, if it costs more, I'll repay thee. Hey, hey, listen, he's coming again. And I want to tell you, he's going to repay the crowd too. If you've given a glass of water in the name of Jesus, you receive great reward. I don't know how small that is to you, but that's big to somebody else. You ever been, I mean, thirsting bad? I mean, somebody you've been out working, laboring, you sweat, and you don't have anything, and somebody arrives with something to drink and gives it to you? You say, thank you, thank you, thank you. They don't, it didn't mean nothing to them. They just did what they felt like they're supposed to do. Did I tell you this is a story of redemption? And he said... He that showeth mercy on him. Aren't you glad God's mercies are new every morning? Yeah. Tell you this little story. I don't like leftovers. Didn't like them when me and my wife got married. She was raised on a farm and she cooked for hands. I tell you, she cooked for me and her like there's 40 of us. And I'd eat that stuff for days. And then when we had boys, she still cooked like that, but there wasn't no leftovers. It's the same God. It's the same refrigerator. Though God was full, the refrigerator was empty. Did I tell you this is a story about redemption? Aren't you glad you're redeemed? Hey, listen, this, this Samaritan, uh, or he said to him, he showed mercy on him. Not the Samaritan. He, he says one who showed mercy. Then he said to Jesus, Jesus said to him, Go and do thou likewise. If I could say anything to you today, go and do thou likewise. It's, it's not easy to take care of folk, but it's the right thing to do. Hey, hey it's, it's, it's easy. It's a lot easier to tempt Jesus than it is to surrender to him. But let me tell you this. Once you surrender to him, you'll find out it's right. Hey, listen, God's never done anything but right. He'll never do you wrong. He'll never do me wrong. He's a great God. I'm glad I have a God that I can trust in. I'm glad I have a God that I can serve. I'm glad that there's a God in heaven woo, who loves you and he loves me. He's a great God. He's a mighty God. Woo! I'm going to be in Luke chapter 15 this morning, but in Galatians it says, 
And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been around independent non soup selling Baptist for 36 years, and I've heard a lot of preaching on the prodigal son. And I've heard a lot of preaching on the elder brother. And I've heard him preached every which way. I've heard the prodigal son preached that he was saved when the Bible says he was lost. The Bible says he was dead. And I'm going to go by what the Bible says. And then I've heard that the elder brother was worser than the prodigal and all kind of stuff. And he was against uh, the father. You, 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 he was against God. But as I was reading and studying and everything, the Lord impressed my heart that the elder brother was weary in well-doing. Well-doing. And I'm going to show you how that you can get weary and well-doing this morning. Amen. We start out in, 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 in verse number 24 there, the, uh, uh, the father, he, he talks about uh, 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 the son being, uh, he's lost and, and he's alive again. And, and then uh, you, 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 the elder brother is coming up to the house. He hears all the music and the dancing and then, uh, you know, in verse number 28, he gets angry and he would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Now look here. This is what I'm seeing uh, today in Christianity. Lots of times we see uh, that the Christian life is, is hard. I mean, it's, it's, it's just like you're prodding along every day. Prodding along and all of a sudden, uh, they, they may be something happen like the, the, the prodigal son uh, come along and everybody's excited about him. Uh, everybody is promoting him. And everybody is praising him. And the elder brother there, look here, he's just coming from the field. And he's been working in the faith. He, he's been working for the Father. But he's not getting any fame, amen. He, he, he's not getting any popularity. And that's what's happening in the Christian movement that I'm seeing today. Uh, all this new stuff that's actually starting up, uh, they're saying, look here, well, I've been here a long time. And I'm not getting promoted. There's an old man and a God in the pulpit there, and he ain't letting me do nothing. Huh? So they're getting weary and well-doing, and they want to do something else. Is that right? Or you'll see an old man of God who's been prodding along, doing what the Lord had him to do, and here comes this young guy, and he's getting all the, all the spotlight. He's getting all the promotion. And he's got a new way about him. And he said, oh man, that's, that's, that's what I've been wanting all these years and I had never got it. Huh? That's what's happening in our, our circles today. That's what's happening. Now, people are getting weary and well-doing because there's no popularity. And this, this boy had a problem when he wouldn't go into the house of God. See, they get to the place that they... They dread going into the house of God. Why? Because they're not popular. They're not getting promoted. That's the truth. Hey Amen. That, that, hey, I, I see it all the time. Even at, at the mission. Man comes along, he gets saved and everything else, and he wants to be promoted. He wants to do things and everything else. And, and as, as, as an older Christian, I try to wait a little bit. Make sure, you know, that he understands he's a novice. Right, right. But they're not worried about that. Right, huh? Right. They want that popularity. Right. Popularity. They want a position. <laughs> yeah. that, that's what they're wanting. That's, and that's what this elder brother was wanting, the popularity, because the devil had come and told him, you're not getting any fame. And he was saying this. 
He said, you're not getting any fruit. Huh? Even though the, the prodigal had said this, how many hired servants is in my father's house? Look here, the elder brother was over all those hired servants. And all those hired servants knew that he is a Christian. You say, oh, Brother Rocky, you don't think he's saved, do you? Oh, yeah, I think he's saved. Huh? As a Christian, let me ask you a question. We'll just get personal this morning. As a Christian, have you, have, have you not ever been envious when somebody else was promoted or whenever some, somebody else received something? Or, uh, you know, probably this morning whenever Brother John said, uh, that church give me $20,000. In your heart somewhere, you probably said, man, I've had a need and God ain't give me $20,000. Huh? Uh, I don't know if it was the, the Lord or the devil used to have a preacher that would come our, our way every once in a while and he had a, a ministry and, and every time he'd come around he'd always tell me how much money uh, 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 that he had got in the mail or what some, somebody else was doing for him or, and, and this was in the early days in the early days and you know I was kind of envious I was kind of angry at God I said God look here what we trying to do huh? he ain't doing nothing That's the truth. That's the truth. That's just that's just that's just human human nature. That's just what we go through. What we go through. But there's reasons why that we do that. Reasons why. Look here. Hey, he wanted some popularity. That, 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 that's what he wanted. But then the father said to him, and and he answered and said to his father, Lo. These many years have I served thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandments. And, and yet thou never givest me a kid that I may make merry with my friends. That's why I believe he was saved. He says, this many years I have obeyed your commandments. I ain't transgressed one of them. And the uh, Gospel of John, John said, if, if a man loved me, it obey my commandments. I believe he loved the Father. I, I believe he was saved. I, I, I believe he remembered the time there, these many years. I, I believe when he, I, I, I believe he was remembered when he got saved. He started doing right. But he didn't get no reward. Huh? He didn't, he didn't get no uh, a reward. He was, he was wanting. He was wanting some popularity. He was wanting some reward. But it didn't seem like he was getting it. Huh? But what does it say? He said this, But as soon as thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Look here. He wanted the popularity, but he forgot about the promise. Forgot about the promise of the Father. Huh? The Father had already promised him he's going to get everything. I've given that boy what he asked for because he was lost. Just give it to him. The Father knew what the prodigal was going to do with it. Huh? He knew what the prodigal was going to do with it. But look here, the elder had the promise of everything. Had the promise of everything. And that, that, that's where we, where we get sometimes. We, sometimes we forget about the promise because we look at the problems. We look at the problems of life and forget about the promises of God. God said, I'm going to supply your needs according to my riches and glory. Isn't that right? And he does. Amen. But we can't forget about that. Hey, and look here. This boy had drawn custom to the presence of the Father. He said, Thou art with me always. Huh? Thou art with me. Look here, in so many churches we go to, we see people who have been raised in church all their life, and look here, when the Spirit of God is moving, they sit there as dead as a hammer. Huh? Sit there, never, never say amen, never make a holy grunt, never do anything, because they've grown accustomed to the presence 
of the Lord. It's on the presence. And you've got to be careful when you grow accustomed to the presence of the Lord because you'll get weary. You'll get weary. Huh? Now, you, hey, you, you, you're not focusing on what you need to focus on. See, he wasn't focusing on He wasn't focusing on the promises. He wasn't focusing on the presence of God. He was focusing on the praise that the prodigal was getting. Huh? He didn't like it. He didn't like it. Because he was weary. He was he was he was weary and well doing. And that's what hey, that's what the devil's plan is. Devil's plan is to get you to focus on everything else. Everything else around you. Except the presence of God. Look here. Whenever I come to a church, you know, the men at the mission and sometimes the supervisor, they'll come run up to me and want to tell me something. I said, "Look here, don't, 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 don't tell me now." Look here, I, 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 I want to feel the presence of the Lord. Huh? I, I don't want to get in my flesh right now. Huh? I, I want to focus on the Lord. I want to feel the presence of God. I come here to worship, amen. I, all them problems can be solved afterwards. You know, just tell me about it on, on Monday. Don't tell me. Don't don't run in there on Sunday Sunday morning early and try to tell me something. Huh? I don't care about it. Really, I don't care. I, I'm focused on, on, on praising the Lord. You know, I, I, and I want to feel His presence. Wherever He is, that's what we're on. And He had been with Him always. That's what he. That's, that's what he. That's what he told him. And, and then he said. He said. He said this. He said, and he said unto him, Son, thou art w- w- with me always, and all that I have is thine. And it was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for thy brother was dead, and is alive again. And was lost and is found. Verse number 24, he said, For this is my son which was dead and is is alive again, and he was lost and is found, and they began to make merry. Now, he he was worried about the the popularity. He forgot about the presence of, of God, and he forgot about his position there the place that uh, the father had him was by him everything he had was going to be him huh? but the one main thing that caused him to be weary and well doing was he forgot about the priority of the father huh? priority of the father was to see that youngest boy say huh? and I promise you you'll get weary and well doing if you forget about one main thing. One main thing is the priority of seeing the lost saved. Amen. I've been at the Crossroads Rescue Mission. <laughs> hey, 20 years. 20 years I've been there. I've been through all kinds of stuff, all kinds of things and everything else. But I thank God that he's kept my focus. Hey, he's kept my focus on the priority of seeing men saved. Amen. Not about personalities. Not about Position. Hey, it's not about being promoted, amen. I'm happy. I'm happy with the place that God's got me at and happy with God, what God's got me doing, amen. Hey, because it's the priority of the Father is to see souls saved. I promise you this morning, if you leave out here after this week of preaching and praising and everything else, if you'll keep your focus on the priority of seeing people saved, you will not get weary in well-doing. Huh? Because what's one soul worth? What is one soul worth? Well, the night I got saved, I believe if I'd have been the only one on the planet, huh? he'd, have, he'd have died for me. Amen? We can keep, our, keep our, our focus on the priority of the Father. See, this old boy was just weary. He was just weary. The Father tried to, t- tried to tell him, look here. The main thing is that your brother is saved. The main thing is about your brother is, is saved. Everything I got is yours. Everything I'm doing is for you. But the main thing that you need to focus on is that your brother got saved. Amen. And that's what we need to focus on. 
all the problems we go through, all the trials we go through, all the trouble that comes in our lives, we just need to brush that aside and be happy in the place that God's got us at. Huh? Happy in the place. Look here, I, I, I tell everybody, I got the best life on the planet. Huh? Because I know I'm in the center of God's will. Huh? I know I'm in the place where God wants me to be. Huh? Hey, I, I try to be the person that God wants me to be. When I first started out in this, I tried to be everybody else. Huh? To try to be like everybody else, everybody other great preacher. Amen. Holy Ghost told me, said, won't you just be yourself? Huh? That's who I, that's who I called. I called you. To try to be the person that you are in the place that God has you at and keep the priority of God in your heart and in your mind. You will not get weary. Look here. It seemed like that I got saved yesterday. It seemed like I got saved just a few years ago. It just keeps it that fresh, Brother Jerry. It keeps it fresh. I, I don't get weary in well-doing. I don't, I, don't, I don't do that. And this old, this old boy, that was, that was his problem. He, that was his problem. I've, I've heard him preach every other way, but the Holy Ghost, when I was, I was reading and studying, kind of whispered in my, in my ear there, he's just weary and well-doing. He just weary. Look here. When you get away from the priority of the, of the Father, you'll be seeking popularity. You'll be seeking praise from everybody else. Huh? Bible says that he must increase and I must decrease. Huh? That's, that's what's happening in our movement today. They've lost their focus on the priority is winning soul. And they started wanting popularity and praise from man. And the Bible says, hey, that they'll love the creature more than the creator. That's what's happening. Amen. Hope it don't happen to you. I told you how this morning. You keep the priority. You keep the main thing, the main thing. That's winning, winning soul this morning. Amen. I'm done, brother. Mark chapter number 11 and verse number 12. The Bible says, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. I want to preach this morning for a few minutes on nothing but leaves. The Lord came by and examined this tree. And just as He examined this tree, He examines all of our lives. And I wonder when He does, does He see us bearing fruit for His glory? Or does He just see a tree full of leaves and nothing else? A song, no matter how beautiful it may be sung, no matter how talented it may be and the ability of the person if there is no touch of God on it it's nothing but leaves preachers a sermon no matter how well outlined it may be no matter how theologically correct it may be I mean you may get excited and loud and I mean you may get real animated in your message but if if there's no juice on it it's nothing but leaves even even with your standards and your convictions which I believe we need more of, not less, in this day and hour. But if all it is is an outward display, but there's no true holiness deep down inside, it is nothing but leaves. In verse 12, I see the Lord's desire. The Bible said He was hungry. He's not on a sightseeing tour looking at the fall foliage. He's hungry. And brother and sister, when you get hungry... You, you don't care what it looks like. You don't care what the restaurant looks like. You don't care what it looks like on your plate. You just want to get it into your stomach. He was not looking for something to satisfy his sight. He was looking for something to satisfy his stomach. And I see his disappointment in verse number 13. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, it looked promising. He came, if happily he might find anything there on. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. 
He was disappointed. I'm just a country boy, grew up in Arkansas. I never have been around the fancy things of life. And uh, probably some of the most fancy eating I've ever done has been with the Fosters. Man, they, they take you some good places. Brother Doug knows where, to, he knows where the good food's at. <laughs> and, uh, amen, you get to know him well, he'll take you some of those places, amen. I, I know him good enough now, we're close enough, I'd, I'd give him the sleeves off my vest. But anyway, uh, there's, there's been at least two times in my life that I went to what you'd call a fancy, classy restaurant. You go in those places, everybody's dressed in the tuxedos and bow ties. I mean, the lights are dimmed low, candles on all the tables. They got a four-string, you know, quartet over there, string quartet playing, and, and uh, the music's just right, and the, the, the atmosphere is wonderful. They bring you your food, and, and there ain't much to it, but it's fancy. I mean, it looks really fancy. Then they bring you the bill, and you found out you're paying three times as much for that than what you would at just a steakhouse up the road where you'd get about four times as much food. And I walked out of those restaurants, and my stomach said, Really, is that it? Are you mad at me? But you know, Brother Hopkins, there's been many a times I got out of a camp meeting that was out late at night, and the only thing open was Waffle House. And we went into Waffle House. There weren't no string quartet. It was a jukebox playing George Jones. You probably had to wipe some grease and syrup off the table because they didn't even clean it down real good. And you go in there, and here comes your waitress. What do you have, doll? You know, and they'll be missing half her teeth, you know. But, you know, as, as, as weird and twilight zone as Waffle House may seem sometimes when they bring that steak and them eggs with cheese and they bring that good toast and you put some of that Schmucker's jam on there. Hey, I've walked out of, and, and even the, I, I didn't even mind the cockroach that I saw crawling across my... I, he even winked at me when he crossed. But I didn't care. He just knows where the good food's at. Amen. But I walked out of there and my stomach said, Thank you, sir. But I'm afraid in this modern day Christianity, uh, people come to church and, and, and the bars and, and that worldly life and those empty relationships have left them hungry and thirsty. And I'm afraid too often they come to our churches and they're disappointed because it's nothing but leaves. So we know what the Lord's not looking for. Very quickly, let me give you three things in our text that He is looking for. Number one, He's looking for suitable fruit. Now, we may be like this tree and have all the appearances of life, but is there any fruit? Could, could we again look at the display of the tree? Verse 13, And see in a fig tree afar off having leaves. It looked good. The leaves indicate that the tree professes to have fruit. I won't have you turn there, but in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, you find the first time that, that figs are mentioned. Adam and Eve used fig leaves to make aprons to cover their nakedness. They had sinned in the garden. And they recognized the problem in their life, but they thought, we can fix this ourselves. And that right there establishes the fig tree as a picture of self-righteousness. I recognize I've got problems and issues and sin, but I can take care of this myself. That's the result of a life of no repentance. You recognize the problem, but you just refuse to repent. And if you're not careful, you'll get eat up with self-righteousness. I see the desolation of the tree in verse 13. He found nothing but leaves. And many professing Christians today were like Adam and Eve in the garden. We've got an apron of fig leaves, but there's just no fruit to back it up. We see it in the priorities of people. The fact, Brother Foster was just talking about it. Church is not a priority to them. Camp meeting is not a priority to them. They're more interested in the ball game. They're more interested in the television. They're more interested in whatever it is. But God and the church and the Bible is not a priority. I, I think the lack of praise and worship in our Baptist churches is an indication of the desolation of our lives. I mean, our Baptist churches are growing so quiet and so cold and so dead, amen, to the point that now, now you've, even got, you've even got a group that's come along and said, well, we'll make something happen. Since we ain't got enough power with God to get a hold of God and actually pray and seek His face and repent, we'll just make something happen. If you have to pump it up and prime it up, it's nothing but leave. I like to go... You know what I like about this church? I've been coming around here. Here's what I like about Brother Foster. We, we have been in some services where it wasn't high. 
I mean, borderline, it just, nothing was happening. You know what I like about him? He didn't try to pump it up. He didn't ignore it either. I watched him back in April when he was here. He got up and said, well, it's been a little off tonight. Let's go home and pray and come back tomorrow night. I was like, I like that. Amen. The old preachers taught us, man, if it don't get on, amen, don't try to pump it up. Just go home and pray and come back seeking the face of God. But our praise is growing quiet and cold. Desolation. Well, in verse number 14, the Lord has a discussion with the tree. Look at it in verse 14. And Jesus answered and said unto it. You ever wondered what the tree said? I mean, the Bible did say Jesus answered and said unto it. That tree said something. Now, some of y'all are looking at me like, we always thought Brother Daniel was a little off, a little bit crazy, like the, like the Lord was going to have a conversation with a tree. Why wouldn't he? He created it. Why wouldn't the Creator have a conversation with his creation? He talks to you, he talks to me. I have no problem believing that that tree said something and the Lord answered it. Maybe you just need some more faith. But I'm more interested in what he said to the tree. No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And we see the death of the tree in verse number 20. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him, Master, Behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. Brother and sister, barrenness leads to destruction. You know why what Brother Rocky preached a while ago is so important? Because barrenness leads to destruction. That's what makes Calvinism so dangerous. You know why the Dead Sea's dead? Because water comes in, but it doesn't have no outlet. It's not going out. And you allow the, the thinking and the mentality of Calvinism to creep into your church and kill the evangelism and the outreach. Hey, I, I'm not saying some of those, I'm sure some of those guys love the Lord and may even have a close walk with God. I have no problem admitting that you can be wrong theologically and still have a walk with God. But the problem is they'll soak it in and they'll soak it in and soak it in, but nothing's going out. And that'll kill a church, that'll kill a ministry, it'll kill your life real quick. And this tree could not exist without the blessing of its creator. And brother, sister, neither can you and I. We cannot exist without God's blessing and His hand upon our life. We will dry up and die spiritually. He's looking for suitable fruit. Number two, he's looking for supernatural faith. Look at verse 22. They've just pointed out this dead tree. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. So there's a connection here between this thing of faith and this tree that had nothing but leaves. Now back in verse number 13, he said this about the tree. It said, For the time of figs was not yet. I don't know about you, I kind of look at that and I'm thinking, man, the Lord's, He's been awful hard on this tree. It's not even the season for it to have fruit. But you've got to remember, He created that tree. He made that tree. He spoke that tree into existence and as the Creator, He has the right to expect whatever He wants from that tree. What he's trying to do is to get us to quit thinking in the realm of the natural. Start thinking and operating in the supernatural. I've seen what the natural can do. I've been in enough church services, I've been in enough revival services and camp meetings where people were trying to operate in the natural, where there was no faith, where there was no confidence in the power of the Holy Ghost, and it was just orchestrated, it was just all about know-how. I've seen the results of that. I don't like it. But I've also been blessed a few times in my life just to see God's people get out of the way and say, Lord, we're looking to you, we're trusting you, our confidence is in you, and I've seen God show up and people get saved and people get in the glory and homes and marriages put back together, but it's only going to happen with supernatural faith. I see the power of faith. Look at verse 20, 23 there. For verily I say unto you that 
Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. I say faith is a powerful thing. Amen. And maybe that's why our churches are really so powerless. There's just not a lot of faith. We've got credit cards. We've got a, we're in good standing with the bank and the loan officer. We've got GoFundMe. <laughs> and I said we have credit cards, didn't I? We got, we got all this stuff. Man, we've been spoiled rotten. I mean, we're complaining about the gas prices and the lumber and all that stuff. Man, truth is, I mean, there's a generation even sitting right here this morning. You remember when it wasn't this good. We have become so spoiled, we've got it so good that we have very little faith in the power of God. So we don't see the power of God much. And preaching is growing weak and watered down. The worship, as we mentioned, just... I mean, I remember people could get up and they could just sing certain songs like your family just sang. And man, that place would come unglued. But that was back when people were just trusting in God and having faith in Him. The power of faith. It talks about the prayer of faith or the possibilities of faith. Look at verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, ye shall have them. Now you've got to read that verse with the understanding that that's that our desires are in accordance with His will. Yep. Amen. That doesn't mean I go down to the local Chevy dealership and lay hands on a new 2021 Suburban and say, Lord, I know this is what you'd have for me. It's probably not, because He knows if I had that, I wouldn't pray every time I get in my Yukon and crank it up, Lord, let this thing start today. <laughs> and then when it does, I say, thank you, Lord. Yeah. I wouldn't, I'd, try, I'd be trusting Chevy more than I would, you know, the Lord. Right. Right. But the possibilities are endless. Brother John just shared that with us. And then Brother Rocky just pointed out the truth of it because I was sitting back there listening to him tell about this story about $20,000. And there was a struggle back there, Brother Hopkins, between the old man and the new man. I know none of y'all deal with that. <laughs> and man, Brother John was saying, I've been in this thing 20 years. Nobody's ever given me $20,000. And the sweet Holy Ghost said, yeah, but you know how to take a nap. So I'm giving him $20,000 because that's what he needs, but you need a nap every day. You hang in there long enough, Brother John, you'll figure out how to get a nap in, I promise you. But I'll be honest with you, that spiritual man was, was strongly outweighing that old man, and I was rejoicing in what God could do for that brother and his family and the faith that he had that God would meet his needs, and I can rejoice not only for him, but just knowing that, hey, God's in the neighborhood. Amen. Amen. There are great possibilities when we just quit thinking in the realm of the natural and we trust our great and mighty God and what he can do. Amen. Supernatural faith. Suitable fruit. Lastly, he's looking for sincere forgiveness. Notice verse 25. When he stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. He speaks of the practice of forgiveness. Now, we're, we're told that faith is essential to the success of prayers. But then he adds that no prayers can be heard from an unforgiving heart. Now, there's a lesson in, in, in forgiveness that we often overlook and leave out. And I'm not going to have you turn there, but in Luke chapter 17, there's a very important truth that's overlooked there. In Luke 17, Jesus is dealing with the subject of offenses. And he has this to say. He said about the offender, if he repent, forgive him. You can't restore somebody that's not willing to repent. And for years, I mean, preachers and Christian counselors and therapists have told people that have been through a tragedy and they've been hurt uh, badly by somebody, wronged by somebody. The first thing, now, the first thing you have to do is forgive them. Well, did they repent? 
Hmm? That person got some bad counsel. And that's where the bitterness came from. Because they got some unbiblical counsel and they're thinking, this person molested me, raped me, murdered my loved one, whatever the case may be, and now this person just said, I can't move on until I forgive them, and they've never even shown any sorrow for it. Well, well, I, my favorite preacher always said, I'm going with Jesus. I'm going with the Bible. If he repent, I mean, it's not a gray area. It's black and white. If he repent. So quit giving people bad, unbiblical counsel. I've heard them say, you know, we're not having revival because of a spirit of unforgiveness. I, I believe that. But then they, they go as far as saying, and it don't matter whether they said they were sorry. It don't matter. You forgive them anyway. Not what Jesus said. I think I'll just stick with the words of Christ. But if you repent, forgive him. Doesn't matter how awful the offense was. Doesn't matter how bad they've hurt you. If you repent. Forgive him. And so we compare Scripture with Scripture so we understand that when you come to Mark 11 where we're at here, he's obviously got in mind somebody who has offended, but they're looking for restoration. They're, they've repented. They're seeking to make things right. And so he tells us, if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses, we are to forgive say, but preacher, you don't understand how bad they hurt me. I don't. But if they're trying to get right, don't, don't be the one that doesn't let them get right. Because that will hinder revival in your life. That will hinder you having fruit for the Lord. We have the purpose of forgiveness. He said there in verse 25, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses, but if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. We have no right to expect mercy if we're not willing to extend mercy. Now some of you are still hung up on that Luke 17 thing, and you're thinking, yeah, see, what about God? He's a forgiving God. Yeah, when we repent. Hey, I mean, let me ask you something. Did you get saved when Jesus died and paid for your sins on Calvary? Or did you get saved when you came to Him through faith and repentance? Amen. And even after we're saved, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just. You know what? He's willing, He's waiting, and He's wanting to forgive, but He will not until we repent. But we ought to have that spirit, that, that willingness, that desire to forgive when somebody does repent. When somebody's trying to get... I mean, that ought, to, that ought to thrill us that they want to get right with us and have that restoration and that fellowship back. But too many people, and I think too many churches, they're more interested in having a feud. They're more interested in having a church split. Amen? Because they got their feelings hurt because somebody hurt them and they just can't get over it. And they'll let the missions program go downhill. They'll let the church suffer. They'll let the doors close. But I am not going to forgive that person. I don't care how many times they apologize. You have nothing but leave. And I'm afraid, church, we've become content with the leaves of religion. Oh, they look good. They look pretty. There's no substance. There's nothing satisfying. You know what we do with leaves at our house in the fall? Me and the kids get out in the yard, we rake them up, we pile them up, and then I burn them up. And it's funny because just a month before, we was driving through the mountains looking at all the pretty leaves going, man, look at that tree. Ain't that pretty? Look at that one. Take a picture of that one. And what was pretty a month later has now become a problem. And so we burn them up and we get rid of them. And I think the, the, the biggest, the scariest thing is how many people are going to stand before God at the white throne judgment and say, Lord, look at my leaves. Look, I'm, I was a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church. Look at my leaves. I sang in the choir. Look at my leaves. I, I even taught a Sunday school class. Look at, look at my leaves. I was a nice person. And he's going to say, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. 
Lord, I pray you take this message this morning. Lord, I do pray that we would have more than leaves in our life. I'm not making light of the outward man. I'm really not. You know my heart, Lord, but I, if it's not down inside there, if it's not in our heart, the work of God will suffer. Our relationship with you will suffer. So I pray that we'll have more than just leaves in our life and that we'll please you in all that we do in Jesus' name. I pray if there's somebody here today that's lost, Lord, help them to not be satisfied with the leaves of religion. Lord, I pray they'll burn them leaves up and get saved and have a relationship, a close walk with you in Jesus' name.